the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab number 738 for Monday, 3 December 2018. <laughs> Mac Observers, Mac Geek Gab, the show, you know, we take your questions, we take your tips, we take all your cool stuff found, we take some of our cool stuff found and our tips, we mix it all together so that each and every one of us, every week when we get together, learns at least five new things. Sponsors for this episode include Ops Genie from Atlassian at OpsGenie.com, Jamf Now at Jamf.com slash MGG, Text Expander from Smile at TextExpander.com slash podcast, and Ring at Ring.com slash MGG. We'll talk more about each of those in a moment here. Here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in Fairfield, Connecticut, where I got down to the wire, but managed to get all my leaves put in bags, and they were just picked up today. This is John F. Ron. And here in another part of Durham, New Hampshire, it's uh, Pilot Pete, and it's darn good to be here. It's good Thanks to have you, Pilot yeah, Pete. Yeah, it's good yeah. to be had. It's, yeah. Yeah. I know, it's been too long. Yes. It's been too long. Welcome back. Yeah. For those of you that have never heard Pilot Pete, and I know there's probably at least some, uh, Pete is, uh, well, he does, he's a pilot, but he... Uh, He's he's great at asking the questions stupid in questions. real time. Really stupid questions. No, not stupid <laughs> questions. It's like really good questions. In right. case we get a little too heady here, Pete go. keeps us grounded, so to speak. And yeah. uh, and it, it it helps out. And of course, we have uh, everybody in the chat room helping us out with that, too, at MacGeekGab.com slash stream. So thanks for that. I'm too. here to prove the axiom. There are no stupid questions, only stupid questioners. <laughs> I thought you were going to say there are no stupid questions just stupid answers well uh, there's that too we, we try not to we try not to there's certainly no stupid questions we try not to give stupid answers but pete keeps us from doing the latter i want to take a quick minute here and thank our first sponsor though which is text expander so look text expander is one of these utilities that i could not possibly live without having on my mac and the way it works is this I have things that I need to type all the time. So do you. Phone numbers, email addresses, responses to people like you folks when you email us questions, right? Or someone that wants to have information about a product that we offer or whatever. You don't want to mess that up, especially when it's a prospective customer. But you really just don't want to mess it up at all. You don't want to mess up your email address, fat finger, or phone number. That's not fun. That's fun to say, fat finger, or phone number. But it's not fun to do. So... Text Expander, right? The way it works is this. You put all those things into Text Expander and you assign them short little keystrokes. So you have all these snippets and then you have the keystrokes that invoke them. So I have one thing at Backbeat Media. When someone emails about uh, doing a certain type of thing, I type comma BBM post and boom, um, like Five paragraphs worth of text are now in my email and they are perfected because I sat down and perfected them. And I can reply to these emails in about 19 seconds now. I don't have to proofread. It's already done. The same when I want to enter my phone number on a web form field or an email address on a web form field. I just type DTMO and my Dave Mac Observer email just appears. You can do this too. Go get Text Expander. It syncs to all your devices, Mac OS, iOS, Windows, and even on the web. It's updated immediately everywhere. You gotta check it out. Go to textexpander.com slash podcast to learn more about Text Expander. You can use it for yourself, your company, both. It's great. And our thanks to the folks at Smile and of course making Text Expander for sponsoring this episode. All right. Uh, let's see. What is what is first on the list here, John? What do we got here? We got something from Paul, right? Right? Sure. Okay. Uh, and it, oh, boy. No. And it's about our favorite application. What's Mail. Up? Mail. It's true. All right. So here we go. Paul writes, I have a few iOS devices and a Mac. I use a .Mac email address, and I have two terabytes in iCloud. I tried to move a bunch of messages from my inbox to other mail folders in iCloud using 
Mac OS's mail.app, but it got all mixed up. I tried rebuilding the mailbox and so on, but it didn't help. And sometimes mail.app would crash. So I disconnected my Mac from the internet, went to iCloud.com on another computer, used mail and iCloud there to get everything cleaned up and the way I wanted it with no problem. My iPhone and iPad are perfectly in sync with iCloud. All three are correct, but my main Mac mail is still messed up. And in fact, the last rebuild inbox left inbox empty on my Mac. I don't want to mess up the true state of my mail and iCloud. How can I safely start over in mail.app on my main Mac? I'm afraid if I connect to the internet now, iCloud mail might think I deleted those emails on purpose when it syncs with my Mac and thereby delete stuff in the cloud as well. So it's a good question. And you know, anytime we have a scenario like this, the first thing I want to say is make a backup, right? Problem or, is, or two. yeah, <laughs> but it's really hard to make a backup or three. of iCloud mail. Yeah. yeah. Right. You, you assume that Apple is making backups for like data loss, but in terms of keeping the state of things, I wouldn't expect Apple to be making those backups or it's certainly not making them available to us. So in order well, to they're make, on the server, they're mm, on their servers. Correct. Right up until you sync with it and change what's on their server. Then they and make a backup of your deleted some, inbox. Right. So my thought in terms of making that backup is create a new account on your Mac, log in to your iCloud mail with this new fresh account and let it sync everything down. Now you have a backup of what was in iCloud in a way that you can like materially use. Sure. You have it on your iPhone and iPad, but we can't really touch those. We can definitely touch what's on the Mac. Okay, pilot Pete expertise time here, Dave. Yeah. Make a new account. How do you sync it with the old account? I'm missing. You, I'm missing you're this. syncing it with iCloud. You're not syncing okay. it with the old account on your Mac. You're making a new account, a on new the, user on, account on the mail. On the Mac. On the on the Mac in Mail app or no? No, no. Okay, you are good. making right. a new user account on your Mac. Good question. Yeah. Right. So it's completely separate user account. We always say it's good for troubleshooting to have a test user account configured mm -hmm. anyway. Sure. So this would be a great use for that. Right. Uh, so you go do that. Sync it down. Now you've got a backup. Now quit out or log out of that user. Log back into the one in question. Um, and before you launch mail, remove the home library mail folder and then relaunch mail. When you do that, it should do the same thing that your test user account did. And it should ask you to log into mail and then hopefully sync everything down. And in that case, it should pull everything down from the server. Whatever was going on with mail on your local machine is gone. And that's an important thing to remember. If all you had was something synced with iCloud, you're fine. But... If you had things in, say, the on my Mac folder, those are now gone, too, because you've removed the home library mail folder. You can go and find them. They are still in there and they're usually relatively well labeled the way mail sort of builds its its archive. But but just be aware if you had anything in there that was not already synced to the cloud uh, or intentionally not synced to the cloud, perhaps for storage reasons or something else, then you just want to be aware of that. So there you go. Yeah, that's uh, that's my thoughts on this. How about you, John? I mean, some other things that I would try. So one is that you could, if you go into system preferences, internet accounts, and go to your iCloud pane, there is a checkbox for mail. Unchecking that and then rechecking that may be a less drastic way of restoring order to the universe. Okay. Right. Yeah. Fair. <clears throat> right. Cause that Just way you'd suggesting. keep, no, that way you'd keep the, anything that was in the, on my Mac section. I kind of like that. Yeah. The other thing that I found is just doing a quick, uh, you know, using the old Google foo here is that another suggestion that I've seen many make online is that whack your com.apple.mail.plist file, which is stored in your home folder library preferences. Last I checked. Yeah. And by destroying okay. that, that may eliminate. Th th there may be some confusion in that file, but by getting rid of it and then restarting mail, that may also bring bring order. Yeah. Yeah. To all chaos. right. Yeah. Okay. I'll give you that. So, just offering, you know, a couple of different things I've tried. I've I've fortunately never run into a case where my email was not 
<laughs> in sync across all my devices. Sure. But, um, sure. But, yeah, but right. Think, yeah. This, I, 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 in case it wasn't clear, right. This shouldn't be happening, but that's the whole reason we exist here is to deal with the things that shouldn't be happening. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Worst case, how many people would celebrate if their inbox was finally empty? So, Paul, you've got that going for you, sir. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> Woo-hoo, you're efficient. Good. Yeah. Yeah. You beat oh, us all. That's good right. Good luck with that. All right. Uh, question number two here is from our Mac Geek Gab forums at macgeekgab.com slash forums from BK Miller there, who says, I have a late 2013 13-inch MacBook Pro. According to system information, the USB ports are USB 3. I just picked up a SanDisk UltraFit USB 3.1 flash drive, 256 gigs, to move my pictures to off of my internal SSD. Uh, these are not in the Photos app, he says. Okay, good. The copy window says I'm moving 175.16 gigabytes and it will take about seven hours. Is that reasonable? According to the file transfer time calculator at techinternets.com, it should take about eight minutes at 3.2 gigabits per second, roughly USB 3.0 speed, as I understand it. Am I right? And there's actually some great discussion from many of you folks um, about how this all fits together. But the lesson here is that you might have so it, it you have the maximum theoretical speed of the uh, of the USB three bus. Then you also have the maximum theoretical speed or perhaps actual speed of the drives themselves. And I say drives because there's the drive in your Mac that is having data read from it, and then there is the drive uh, in this external uh, SSD that is having data written to it, and. Both of these matter, right? Because whatever the weak link in the chain, whatever the slowest link is, is going to define what it takes to copy these files. But then there's one more step, and that is the overhead of actually copying files. If you were just taking data from one drive and beaming it to another, then whatever the slowest drive was would dictate how fast that data would be copied. But that's not what's happening. What's happening is the finder is going, it's reading the details about each file uh, one at a time. Okay, cool. Here's the details about this file, the name, the size, some other attributes. Great. Now we have to go to the destination. Let's create the shell for that file, create, write a directory entry. Great. Now let's copy the data over. Okay. Now let's seal up that file. Okay. It's closed. Great. Now let's move on to the next one. So much of what I just described was not the raw data being beamed across. A lot of it is the setup and the finishing of that. And so the more files you have, especially the more smaller files you have, where you have a greater ratio of setup time to data transfer time, the longer it's going to take. So, yeah, you might if you've got, you know, if if you've got a thousand files that um, are each one megabyte and you have one file that's a gigabyte, those thousand files are going to take a lot longer to copy than that one. And that's sort of the trick right there. And, and with these pictures, yeah, I mean, they've got some, some bulk to the data, but there's probably just a lot of pictures. So that's probably part of what's slowing it down. Thoughts on this, John? Well, I'm with you in that the, the theoretical maximum of a port is rarely the maximum speed that you're going to see. It's right. probably going to be limited by the performance and especially with what I'll call non SSD flash drives. Sure. Like this one, I just looked at the specs and they say, well, you can get up to 130 megabytes per second read speed. They don't even specify the write speed. So, um, yeah, you got to look at all, all the, uh, all the numbers in the equation to figure out where the bottleneck is. And in this case, the bottleneck is not USB. It's, it's the drive. Yeah, you know. if you want to see how fast your drive is itself, uh, I recommend running Blackmagic disk speed test. It just writes a block of data to the drive and then reads that block of data and then writes a block and reads a block and back and forth. And that lets you really test to see how fast an individual drive is. You can point it at one drive at a time. And we'll put a link to that in the show notes, of course. Yeah. That's well, what right. I like what they do is that because uh, I, I guess it's it, it's meant to help, uh, though it, it, it'll serve everybody, but that they'll do different file and block sizes to, to kind of give you, uh, last I checked, um, right. in that's order right. for you to grok, okay, well, you know, if I'm writing a big blob of data, typically that's where you get the best performance. If you have a huge 
continuous file, then you'll get the best performance. If it's a bunch of you know teeny little files, as you pointed out, then uh, you're not going to get the maximum throughput. That's yeah, just, you just got overhead. That's just all. life. Yep, that's just life. It's true. It's true. You want to take us to Royce, John? Yeah, Royce has an interesting one, <clears throat> which we're kind of digging into here. Um, but Royce says aloha, and he says aloha because it looks like he's out on this little island called Hawaii. So aloha, which I think is both hello and goodbye. So I've recently been having issues with doing backups to external drives from my MacBook Pro 13-inch mid-2012. Ah, very similar to what I have. Actually, I get error messages partway through on many types of drives except Western Digital. Most of the externals are one terabyte or larger. My MacBook Pro has a one terabyte SSD drive upgraded from OWC, and it's formatted as APFS. I also keep my very large iTunes library, currently four gigabytes, on an external USB 3 WD platter drive. Whenever I try to super duper it to another external, I get the negative 50 error message. Fish shape. This message disabled the copy to drive until I restart the computer. Any ideas or quick fixes? This is a relatively new issue, and I have had problems copying. I've never had problems copying large drives before. So I'll throw you my insight on this. Okay. Maybe you have some additional fellas. But um, so my understanding uh, number one is that Super Duper has a logging capability. Um, I actually downloaded it and checked it out. Uh, if you go to the window menu and then show log, it will give you more detail about what's happening, including uh, a post that I found that showed, in addition to giving you a stupid numerical error message, it would tell you what it means. So first off, I would do that. I found a post on Mac Rumors that actually showed one where it said, oh, it's error negative five. That's an input output error, which, which probably means that there's a... a Probably means it's a hardware problem um, or your drive is damaged. Sure. Uh, though it could be other things. Um, so that should help identify the file. Uh, so look at the log and that, that should help identify the file and the volume SuperDuper is having issues with. Now, you may want to try another backup utility. I, I think the other big player in this space is Carbon Copy Cloner. So you may want to try that and see if you get the same problem. Um, if you don't, then maybe it's a bug in SuperDuper. I don't know. Um, Huh. Yeah. I right. Sure. And they have a free trial, 30 day free trial. So, you know, check out Carbon Copy Cloner. Um I uh, from what I understand, uh, I think you're you're a super duper guy, Dave. I no, I was for a while and then there was years ago there was an issue where Super Duper couldn't uh schedule itself to do backups and I needed scheduled backups, huh. so that's when I switched to Carbon Copy Cloner. They relatively quickly remedied that problem, but I've been on CCC ever since, so there you go. Yeah. Just for what it's okay. worth, my experience with Super Duper has been good uh, customer support, though. When yeah. you send them, send oh, them, they're great. You know, yeah, you yeah. send them your logs, and or they'll ask for your logs, and uh, right, and they'll help you get to it. Yeah. Okay, but, but I think feature-wise, they're pretty much on par with each they're other very there are some things that are different between the two but mm -hmm. but in terms of cloning and that sort of thing yeah 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 so. um so one thing i would try so this, this is the whole troubleshooting scenario here so one try a different utility see if you get the same problem I like that yeah if yeah. you don't then you gotta then i would suspect you may have a hardware issue now the thing is it could be the media it could be your cable, it could be your enclosure, or it could be the port that you're plugging this external drive into. Uh, I believe those are all the pieces of the puzzle here that you would have to look at. And, and the way to determine this is to just, you know, methodically try different ones and see, uh, try to isolate it to a certain device or, or, you know, again, cable or port or something like that. It could be any of them. It's hard to tell here because the error message is really telling you nothing. Sure. Uh, yeah. I had an issue a while ago with Carbon Copy Clone on one of my machines where, it, you know, I schedule a do backup and, and it would send me an error message, which these utilities typically do. And it said, yeah, it failed. Um, and their help actually said, well, you know, you may have a problem with your cable or your, your hardware. And it turns out um, the enclosure that I was using was just flaky and uh Took the drive, same drive, uh, different cable. Um, 
different enclosure and that solved the problem and I didn't have the problem anymore. So, cool. um, so that's pretty much what I got. So, uh, it, it, it follow our troubleshooting, you know, follow the troubleshooting method here, you know, be disciplined in the, the things yeah, change, that you swap change in and one out. thing in test, change another right. thing in test. Yeah. I, I think it's correct. Right. Yeah, yeah. I think that's yeah. good, man. Do not. Uh, yeah. Because if you, the, the problem is if you change multiple things and then you get different results, you're unable uh, or maybe you are if you're a superstar, yeah. but <laughs> I would say you, you got to change one thing at a time and see, uh, that, and that will help you isolate the problem. Reduce your variables. That's it. Yeah, exactly. All right. Jumping to listener Ken. Ken writes, he's actually got two questions. He says, um, I keep wondering that, uh, or he says, uh, there it is. He says, I keep wondering that since net neutrality was stopped, my browser is slow to load sites. I won't go into details. So does anyone agree with me? Um, it's hard without having details, but, uh, I, well, I haven't experienced this. Ken is on charter. So I'm on Comcast here. So two different providers, I haven't heard of anyone else having an issue with charter and and so what may seem to be intentional slowness, but um, it's possible that loading a site, the, especially the initial load, right, has um, a DNS query that happens first. You got to look up the IP address and then go and do the uh, you know the the actual request of the site. Most of the time, unless you intentionally change it, your DNS server is going to be uh, that from your provider, your Internet provider. So it's possible that they might be steering you wrong intentionally or otherwise. We've, we've seen this before. Uh, there is a, a DNS service. There's several DNS services that you can use. We For years, we talked about Google's at 8.8.8.8. .8 .8 .8. And now Cloudflare is is kind of the new one on the scene, relatively new anyway, at 1.1.1.1. And th that that could be a good thing to test is just change your DNS. If you're on iOS, Cloudflare via their 1.1.1 service has an app that is called 1.1.1.1. And it's actually kind of a cool app because what it does is it doesn't just change your DNS it tunnels your DNS and only your DNS over a secure tunnel. So no one knows what you're looking up except anyone at Cloudflare, of course, because they know where your they DNS They want to know. Yeah. But they, <laughs> they say they don't log it. Well, they say they don't log it on their end. They log it on your end by default, sure. but you can go into the app and turn that off. But that can actually, in and of itself, be a great little troubleshooting tip. If you're trying to figure out what uh, server a, an iOS app is trying to connect to, and you can't see that run Cloudflare, you'll be able to see because it logs it, but yeah, it runs as a, a VPN, even though it's not tunneling all of your traffic, it's just tunneling your DNS lookup. So you still maintain your local connection and all the speed and everything for your, for your stuff. So, uh, I would test with that. That would be my, um, that would be my thoughts. I'll, I'll, John, I'll get your thoughts on this and then I'll move to the second part of Ken's question. I mean, the only other thing that occurs to me is some sites, almost every site can potentially throttle you as well. That's true. Just because, just because I pay. So, so right now I'm paying for uh, 200 megabits down, 35 up. Um, I rarely ever see that sort of performance. <laughs> really? <laughs> well, the, 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 the thing is, the server that you're talking to, the web server that you're talking to, or whoever you're talking to on the internet absolutely has the capability to throttle their bandwidth because, right? I mean, Yeah, of course. Yeah, I, I'm, I, I'm just surprised that you're not seeing, because I have uh, essentially 1,000 down and 40 up rounding. And I routinely see downloads of, you know, 900 plus and uploads mm -hmm. are always at, at, at my max. So I'm just surprised that you're running into places that are throttling you that much. Um, yeah. I mean, it yeah. depends on the, the content. We, we won't sure. really go into much detail about what content. Ken, Ken didn't want to go into detail either. So I think you might <laughs> have found a kindred spirit, my friend. <laughs> All right. Let me go to the second half but, of Ken's question. Yes. He says, uh, 
I've tried Jamf many times, but since I don't have a business, I can't supervise any device. Am I wrong? And uh, and and as I mentioned at the beginning of the show, Jamf is one of the sponsors of the show. So I decided I would I would sort of try and merge these two things together. So we'll answer Quinn's question and and acknowledge Jamf as a sponsor and and do their spot here. Because as for Jamf now, no, you don't have to have a business to use it. You can just go sign up at Jamf.com, J-A-M-F dot com slash M-G-G for free. And uh when you choose a device to supervise or manage, and perhaps I think this is where Ken's confusion came in. He says, well, without a business, how do I tell Jamf to manage these devices? And that's the key, right? When you sign up and choose to manage a new device, it will walk you through the process of installing a profile onto that device. It'll work on Mac OS, works on iOS. And once you've got that profile in there, that profile is essentially you saying, yes, I am allowing myself to via Jamf manage this or Jamf now manage this device. And that profile is, is sort of the glue that ties all that together and allows your iOS device to be remotely managed via Jamf now. And once you do that, then you can manage any device. It can be yours. It can be a family members. It can be a client's. It can be an employee's it, it, any of those things. And this is sort of the beauty of Jamf now is it just works. And the other beauty is that your Jamf now account has up to three devices for free at all times. So if you're only managing three devices, then you pay nothing. If you want more, more devices start at just $2 a month per device. And as I said, you can create your free account at jamf, J-A-M-F dot com slash M-G-G. And you can control all kinds of things, right? You can check your digital inventory to see everything you have. You can distribute Wi-Fi and email settings. You can deploy apps. You can enforce passcodes. You can protect company data. You can even lock or, if necessary, remotely wipe a device from anywhere without any IT experience. So again, uh, I think that answers Ken's question. And of course, um, uh, you know, I wanted to thank our sponsor and it's jamf, J-A-M-F dot com slash M-G-G. And obviously we, we very much appreciate uh, your question, Ken. Hopefully the answer helped and uh, we appreciate Jamf as a sponsor for this episode. All mm -hmm. right. No, that's good. I, I actually, uh, when I did, um, you know, some, uh, some stuff with a uh, Mac OS server, which offers uh, a subset of functionality at Champ, I would say. The one thing that thrilled me, Dave, that I was able to do is I was able to disable the camera app on one of my devices. Yes, which... that's right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I, I think the only requirement is, do you have a family? Do you have multiple devices? Do you have a family? You don't need a business. But, mm -hmm. but if you have devices where you want to monitor, more or less limit the functionality, then... Well, it's not, and it's not just you. limiting, it's controlling, right? Like if somebody yes. calls, we just had somebody write in this week that says, oh yeah, you know, my mom somehow keeps erasing an email account <laughs> from her iPhone. She's like, I don't know how this keeps happening, but it was driving me crazy. So they built a Jamf Now profile and can not only manage it, but keep it from being erased in the first place. So yeah, no, it's- So it, they they- disabled the yeah the ability to 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 destroy your your uh <laughs> yeah exactly I love it. yeah it's great it's great so again uh one last time jamf jamf.com slash mgg all right uh we've got some tips here john shall we we'll go to uh we'll go to listener scott sweetly yeah scott uh, says i was recently recording my daughter's taekwondo class and found a new feature on my iphone Using the while using the camera app, you can tap the one X zoom indicator next to the shutter button to switch lenses again on a phone that has two lenses to the two X level. That's not new, he says. But while making a video or slow mo and maybe more, if you were to tap and hold on the one X zoom indicator and then drag your finger up and down, you can then fine tune the level of zoom that you'd like to use. And that is surely a thing. Yeah, it's pretty cool. And that fine tuning actually can be done. Uh, on any device that doesn't need to be a, a dual lens device, but, uh, but you don't obviously get to use another lens on a non, uh, non dual on a single lens device. It's, there you go. Yeah. I would offer that you would also want to, uh, make sure you're, if, if you want to zoom in, you want to tap, get, so you've got the macro 
lens and then and then fine tune because you can also fine tune from the one lens and it's that's all digital zoom right so right right yeah yep right yeah if if you're if you have you a can, multiple lens yeah if you've got a multiple lens device you yes. can you can digitally zoom from the from the is it micro macro and the the one one power lens and the two power lens you want to be in the two power lens and then zoom from there uh actually that's i i, I get what you're saying right but you're switching to your but you're not you don't have to lens. worry about it ios no. does that for you does it if you get uh, if you're zooming and you get past 2x it jumps to the 2x lens yeah. you don't have to oh, switch very first clever yes <laughs> those guys have thought of everything they have yeah no <laughs> i it, I, yeah. I thought of that first when it when it first yeah. came out it was like oh actually no it's already doing the switching got yeah. it okay the, the camera on the 8 plus and the 10 and, and 10 max <laughs> yeah it's it's good right up until the moment that you use a, a camera on one of the Huawei phones or the new Pixel yeah. Three or you know anything like that. That's right. Yep. This yeah. is the Mac Geek. I understand. I just, we just like to acknowledge <laughs> the fact that if you want the best camera that you can yeah, get well, in a smartphone, it yeah. doesn't have an Apple logo on it. That's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Man. Yeah. Those Huawei. I gotta say, I'm I'm those I'm Huawei very cameras happy. are awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Oh. Okay. But I got to say the iPhone 8 camera, um, I think one of the breakthroughs with Apple that they maybe want to use that camera more is the improved uh, night performance and the anti-jitter. I mean, that that that's. So this is actually where Google has mm -hmm. Apple beat. Like, yeah, you're sure. right that, that it's way better as of the phones that Apple released last year, the 10 and the 8 and the 8 plus, mm -hmm. obviously. But it like. It, it does not hold a candle, no pun intended, to mm -hmm. what you can get on the new Pixel 3 or even, the, like I said, the new Huawei phones or not even the new ones. But the Huawei phones for the last two years have been uh, just stellar yeah. with that low light stuff. Oh, yeah. it's, it's crazy. And there's some amazing aftermarket apps, too, to make yes. the cameras. You know, and it, if I may offer quickly, I see uh, Lapsit is one of my favorites. It does time lapse photography. I, I, have I ever shown you a setting? Huh? I've, I've set up. I'll have to find a way to to get it to you but it's sure. a time lapse uh i set the camera up before we blocked out from one city and left it running until after blocking in another and one shot every three seconds and yeah. then you can and you, with laps that you can put music to it and slow down because otherwise it looks like you're taxiing at 300 knots right you know that, right. that doesn't work well so you can slow down the playback stretch out the playback and the and the together so yeah that's pretty cool i've yeah. done that i've done that with just apple's time lapse where i take my phone and put it uh, like if i have yeah. a window seat I right. wedge it in the the sure. thing and just do it for the whole flight yeah. uh, or parts of the flight. Yeah. But but like you said, you get you know you get you taxiing it. It it's super speeds, speed. yeah. yeah. So this this can adjust your playback speed uh, so that it works out nicely as cool. well. And it, yeah, hits all those. I put a now, link. Does in the it show let notes. you? Uh, does it let you dub in uh, yakety sax? Because <laughs> it most it, time lapse it, stuff is, is just hilarious with yakety sax. That, that's a good know, point. Like, I hadn't even thought of that. But yeah, it, you, yes, you can dub in your all your own music. You can put in all kinds of things. It, it it's it's neat. That's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and then there's a Pro HDR app too that manually sets your exposures different. And, I don't know. It's just again because I watch Benny Hill for yeah, so much. Right. Anytime da, 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 I see a sped up video, I think of yakety sax. You have to. <laughs> there you go. All right, I'll put a link to Pro HDR in the in the show notes too. Oh, thank you, sir. All right, we got a note from Lawyer Jeff, and he says, uh, here's a cool stuff found for the upcoming holidays. What do you do with all of those credit card style gift cards where there's just a small amount left on them? You've got a Visa gift card, an Amex gift card. It's got a couple of bucks on it. They're banking on you not being able to spend that down to dollar zero, and that's actually how they make some of their money. But- Lawyer Jeff has. You can send those to. Oh, that's right. <laughs> he says go to Amazon.com and buy a custom Amazon gift card for the exact amount left on your gift card. Then have the Amazon gift card email delivered to your own account's email address. Amazon allows you to buy a gift card for any amount between one dollar and two thousand dollars. So that two dollar and thirty two cent gift card balance is transformed into something that you can actually use. You'll receive a receipt email, then the gift card email. Click the link and the gift card balance will be added to your Amazon account. Then an email confirming your recipient received their gift card. It says, I recently spent an evening buying a dozen of these Amazon gift cards that way. And then I bought a hundred dollar Apple gift card with it. So there you go. That's pretty good. 
this is this is actually one of the reasons I love the whole quick tip thing, because yeah. I have been doing exactly this for about the last five years and never once thought to mention it in the show. Sure. Right. Okay. But as soon as That's Jeff's great, email yeah. came in, it was like, oh, my gosh, of course, we should mention this in the show. So thank you, Jeff. You uh, this is why the quick tip category exists. It's perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> I wonder what ever happened to so that they were floating this thing in my area, Dave, from Coinstar. You know Coinstar, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they briefly had kiosks in in my neighborhood, um, and I think they call it Coinstar Exchange. They would do something similar. It's like, hey, you got a gift card? We'll we'll give you money for it. Okay. But I think the last time I I tried one and I put in the gift card. So apparently there's some gift card network where you can check the value and it's like, oh yeah, twenty dollar gift card. I'll give you fifteen bucks for it. And I'm like, nah. Thanks for asking. <laughs> oh, interesting. Huh? huh. Well, they only yeah, they give you so the full balance, ninety two percent or something, if you take cash, right? Yeah. 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 Huh. Yeah, but um, so it sounds like this other thing is a. Uh, uh, gives you a better deal which yeah you yeah. get to preserve your value assuming that you shop on amazon which you know um i'm pretty sure we all do so there you go so they give you a hundred percent wow well you're just buying okay. a gift card it's all you're doing it amazon right. is buying a gift card for whatever amount you've told it to using a credit card that you've told it to use and your credit card is your you know your visa gift card or your amex gift card or whatever it is so yeah it's great Right. But you see what I'm saying? The, 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 you know, a lot of these services, I mean, well, I guess their benefit is we'll, we'll give you the value, um, but you got to use it in our store, not theirs. Yeah. I feel like you might be misinterpreting what I'm saying. They are not taking okay. like, say, a Macy's gift card and giving you any value for it. It's only get gift cards that are credit cards. So yeah, like, like a Visa, Visa tires, you know, yeah. master- debit cards. Okay. Yeah, like yeah. the the, so the, like, the fixed value. You know, you buy somebody a fifty dollar Visa card and give it to them as a gift when they've got four seventeen left on that because you know they can't buy a cup of coffee. For, okay. No, for no, some. I get. It. I that, get it. You see what I'm so saying? So it's not yeah. a proprietary. It's not no. like a, a a store gift card. Correct. Which, Correct. Which this coin coin star thing? Yeah. Last I checked, would do, but the price you pay is that you don't get the full value. Correct. Hey, it's That's right. Personal. That's yep. That's right. Yeah. But I guess the benefit is mm-hmm. you get something you want versus something you don't want. <laughs> right. Exactly. You know, exactly. Yeah. If somebody gives you a, you know, right. pink gift gift card, I, I, I've been shopping with you at the mall several times and you've never gone into pink and wanted to buy anything. So <laughs> I'm assuming that gift card would not be of any great value to you. You could turn that in. No. <laughs> Even 80% of that might be, might be valuable. You haven't so. seen John in his juicy sweats? Is that what yes, you're saying? Man. I, like, I, I, whatever Sorry, you want to do is fine. I don't really care. I, I didn't I'm mean to paint that enough. mental picture, folks. Yo, I, I don't need any extra juice, man. I got there plenty. it is. Ready. Okay, Graham, save us. Uh, <laughs> Graham. <laughs> yeah, for the love of Pete. Uh, Graham says, I've been... Uh, I've just been doing the legwork on creating historical evidence that involves collecting lots of financial statements, and I wanted to combine many months of separate PDF statements from my bank into a single PDF file. Prior to Mojave, I have done this using a Python script that was seemingly built into macOS Automator. However, today, when I was right-clicking on the selection of PDFs so as to use the Finder's batch rename feature, because they weren't named alphabetically, I decided to check the quick actions option and was pleasantly surprised to see a create PDF item listed. Sure enough, when I used that on my selection of PDFs, it created a single PDF just as I wanted. So much faster than having to remember and type and then syntax check a Python command. So that's pretty cool. I had no idea that that was there in uh, in Mojave. So thanks for the thanks for the heads up, Graham. It's good stuff. Good stuff. Don't you think, John? Good. Yeah. <gasps> Combining PDFs. Haven't you been able to do that in preview? Yeah, but not in the finder. You can do right, it in preview okay. when you open the thumb. You're correct. You're absolutely right. You can do it in preview with the thumbnail view and drag things around. Uh, that's correct. Yeah. But this is just highlight them, quick action, right click, quick actions, create PDF done, which is awesome, I think. No, I get it. But um, yeah. an you're additional right. tip. Yeah. Preview has much power in that yeah so i, I if, if you load a pdf and then you i guess copy a pdf and then paste it it'll it'll munge them together which is like oh that's kind of a nice feature yeah yeah i haven't had to do it for a while though but right 
options. Right. Yeah, yeah. Huh. No, it's handy. Yeah, exactly. Uh, in 737, last week's episode, we talked about Alan's issue with restoring from a backup. Uh, and Dominic wrote in and says, I'm afraid it's too late for Alan uh, for, with this tip. He says, but the quickest way to back out of a jammed Mojave update is to restore from a time machine APFS snapshot to a hard shutdown by holding the power button, then reboot into recovery mode with command R. In there, select Restore from a Time Machine Backup. The first source on the list is very likely to be the Mac's own startup disk, which is where the snapshots are. Select this, unlocking File Vault encryption if necessary, and you'll be presented with a list of snapshots from the past 24 hours or so. Restore the latest, and after just a few seconds, the Mac will reboot to its state right before the failed update. It says, I've done this on SSD only and on Fusion Drive Macs, and it's worked every single time. I've had to do it more than I might like because I follow the beta releases, but he says that's the price I pay. The technique is also useful for removing all trace of software that I evaluate and decide not to keep. Oh, that's really interesting. Uh, while on the subject of snapshots, he says carbon copy cloner, uh, can do cool things with APFS snapshots, but its own if enabled, uh, and those made by time machine, both its own and, it, and those made by time machine in particular, it can mount any snapshot read only providing a much quicker way to retrieve lost files than digging them out of a traditional time machine backup. If you're feeling really geeky, you can mount two snapshots and do stuff like see how a file changed from one to the other. So very, very cool. Thank you for that, Dominic. I, you know, th again, this is why we love quick tips, even though that one wasn't entirely quick, but just remembering that these snapshots in APFS are there and can save us from a scenario like a failed update is, you know, it's sort of mind blowing if you rewind five years, but, uh, but it's, it's the world we live in today, which is pretty cool. So anybody thoughts on that, Pete? Oh, that's brilliant. Okay. That's, that's fast. It's brilliant. It's fast. Yeah. That's the thing. Is it's because it's right there. It's yeah. not actually restoring. It's just moving a pointer and saying, go use that. Yeah. Nice. It's pretty good. I don't know. And speaking of snapshots, uh, is. that is something which uh, I've been noticing as of late um, because I'm doing Carbon Copy Cloner to APFS, but Carbon Copy Cloner maintains, and I'm looking right now, and I got a big, long list here of snapshots that it made. And if I want to restore to a certain point, it will let me do that as well. So that's nice. nice. Yeah, it's and pretty cool. I'm pretty cool. sure Super Duper does the same thing. Does Super uh, Duper work with snapshots? That that part I wasn't sure of. I don't uh, use them, so I can't answer. Yeah. Um, All I know is I see them in Carbon Copy Cloner. It's showing. like a, it, it looks like it's making them like hourly, which... Uh, I'm wondering what algorithm they're using here. But, well, um, all it's got to do is drop an anchor and you're done. All, is 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 do you have carbon copy cloner set to to make those snapshots or are those the time machine snapshots that you're seeing in carbon copy cloner, John? Oh, that they may be. Well, they have a time machine. Yeah, because icon next to them. There you so go. So it may be the ones that they're making, and it's just making you aware that yeah, that, if you want to restore one that's of these, right. then yep. okay. Very cool. All right. In the uh, in the Mac Geek Gab forums from Crazy Moose, we have a great little tip. Have you ever wanted to watch YouTube but remain, quote unquote, productive? Uh, once you start watching a YouTube video, control click or two finger tap or right click twice on the video. You will be presented with a new menu. Select enter on picture in picture and like magic. The video will pop out of Safari and be presented to you in one of the four corners of your monitor. An alternative is that there is an app on the Mac store called Helium. If you download this, this app, you're able to use the share option via Safari to send YouTube, Netflix, or any other video provider to place videos on top of whatever else you're doing. Hope this helps out some of my fellow Mac users. Those are that's two great tips. I like it. That's pretty good. Huh. Never heard of Helium before. Huh. All right. Pretty good. I like it. Thanks for that. Crazy moose. Good stuff. We'll put a link in the show notes, of course. Any uh, thoughts on that before I go to our last tip here for this episode? Yeah, I like, I like helium. Cool. Makes you talk, makes you talk funny. No, that's not what he meant. I think he meant I it know. like a balloon. It floats <laughs> yes. it up, right? So what are you saying, John? <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> okay. 
Uh, on Twitter, we're lightening the mood, Dave. You I know. know you were cranky. We got you no, happy it's now, good. right? It's yeah. Good. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Lighten the mood. Lighten oh, the mood. I, yeah, Lighten up, Francis. Lighten up, Francis. <laughs> One of my favorite lines. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I had a uh, a physical and a, a TDAP booster shot today, so mm. a little, a little, a little out of the game. What? But TDAP. Uh, t- 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 Tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis, I think, was oh. my booster shot. It had been over oh, 10 yeah. years. So there you go. Yeah. I think I got one of those recently. I didn't I get a flu shot, though, because I know the, the goal of that is that they're actually trying to harvest your DNA to work towards it have let you watched get, that let me styles? get my let me get my tinfoil hat no i you know me i i emotionally support all conspiracy theories even those that i cannot john we're not allowed support. to talk about that or the chemtrails brother well no in in in, in x files the smallpox vaccine <laughs> was was a ruse to harvest dna sure. to to uh you know work towards the upcoming alien invasion yeah. right yeah yeah Yep. You know who okay. else is harvesting our DNA is Twitter. But the good news is on Twitter, Andy actually had a bit of salient advice. He, We were talking about the new iPad Pro 11 inch, but any 2018 iPad Pro. And he wanted to restore it from a backup that he had on his Mac. So he got a uh, USB-A to USB-C cable because that's what the iPad Pro has. And that's what his uh, 2013 MacBook Air has, and it wouldn't work. It wouldn't see it. It would, in fact, it complained. And uh, he contacted Apple, and Apple informed him that cables need to be USB 3.1, not 3.0, 3, USB 3.1 to be compatible with the 2018 iPad Pro. Of course, Apple doesn't sell one of these cables at the moment, I don't think. So you've got to go find one. But uh, but yeah, USB A to USB C, and it all has to be three point one. So wow, there you go. Good good find though, Andy, and thank you for uh, for letting us know. That's good stuff. So thoughts on that, gentlemen? Gentlemen, where? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> hey, uh, how does it sound to you all if uh, if I talk about our next couple of sponsors here? Dandy. All right. I'd like to thank Ops Genie for sponsoring this episode. In fact, I'd like to thank Ops Genie for doing what they do, because as we all know, like this show wouldn't exist if incidents weren't inevitable. And really, it comes down to being prepared, right? You don't want to get caught. We say it all the time. Ops Genie helps you not get caught because what Ops Genie does is It's a system that helps you plan for disruptions because you know they're going to happen and to stay in control during incidents. So Ops Genie gives your team the power to respond quickly and efficiently to unplanned issues. We've talked about this. All issues like this are unplanned, right? It helps you notify the right people at the right time. So if someone's asleep, but someone else is awake, it knows who's on duty when it knows who's off for the weekend or who's off for a holiday or who's off on Tuesday. And it's smart about making sure the right people are notified at the right time. In addition, because Ops Genie is now part of the Atlassian family, not only does that mean it links with everything else that Atlassian does, but because Atlassian is so open, it links with lots of other stuff. You know, Jira, of course, Amazon CloudWatch, Datadog, New Relic, all of those things tie right in because that's how Atlassian is. And that's now how Ops Genie is. It tracks all your activity and provides really useful insights to improve future incident responses. So here's how it goes. Visit OpsGenie.com to sign up and get a free, yes, free company account, no credit card required. And then you can add up to five team members to that free account. That's OpsGenie.com. Never miss a critical alert again with Ops Genie, because with Ops Genie, your next incident doesn't stand a chance. Our thanks again to Ops Genie and Atlassian for sponsoring this episode. And I'd like to thank Ring at ring.com slash MGG for being a sponsor here today. Look, we've talked about Ring. Ring is the reason that smart home stuff began making sense to me, right? We started talking about this last year because 
Ring does it right. The whole out-of-box experience is very Apple-like. They include all the right tools to get everything set up. The first thing that I got from them, of course, was their doorbell, the video doorbell. And then I got floodlights, and suddenly my house was smart. It could do all of these cool things. And, of course, that opened a beautiful can of worms that I could just head down. Well, after reinventing the doorbell, Ring knew there was something else, and they just reinvented the home alarm system. We all know that traditional alarm companies prioritize high monthly premiums and try to tie into long-term contracts. So Ring changed that. The Ring Alarm is, like everything else they have, easy to install, affordable, and it's a home security system with no long-term contracts. You build the system that's right for you and your home, and you have it up and running in minutes. And then the Ring Alarm Security Kit comes with everything you need to protect your home and 24-7 professional monitoring is only 10 bucks a month if you like. Very, very cool stuff. It's really a smarter way to protect your home. And the Ring Alarm Security Kit is available, as I said, at ring.com slash MGG. And, of course, retail stores across the U.S. So go to ring.com slash MGG to learn how you can get whole home security for just 10 bucks a month. Our thanks to Ring at ring.com slash MGG for sponsoring this episode. All right, John, we've talked about different types of speed discrepancies, right? In terms of copying files, we've talked about it with, um, with various things here. And I want to talk about another type of speed discrepancy. And David leads us down this path quite nicely. Uh, he started an email trail with us and he said, I just upgraded my Comcast internet service to gigabit speeds. And the Nighthawk X6 router that I have has been working flawlessly up to this point, cannot get past about 500 megabits per second. My modem is the Netgear CM1000, so I know that's okay. And plus, I plugged Ethernet directly into my Mac and got gigabit speeds. I power cycled both devices. I did a hard reset of the router and set it back up. Same results. I searched Google on this and it seems some, fo some folks were having issues with this and found it to be working sometimes, but most of the time not. Any thoughts? I'm tempted to give in and go with the Orbi as an excuse to move to mesh, but I would like to get this router working properly. So, and we went back and forth. I wanted to make sure that he was actually testing uh, his router with these speeds when he plugged in Ethernet and not just plugging directly into the cable modem. And sure enough, if he plugs in Ethernet to the router, he gets his gigabit downstream speed. He's with Comcast, so he's like me. He has a thousand down and then 40 up. So, uh, but those speeds worked. And here's the thing um, your router can definitely handle gigabit speeds, right? It can route them. Um, and you're proving that when you're doing the test over Ethernet. The problem is Wi Fi. So, Let's talk about this because generally speaking, you're not going to see gigabit speeds in the real world over Wi-Fi um, with any router. What? Right. I know. It's crazy. You buy a router. No, I'm going to I'm, I'm gonna interject a small fish shake and I'll let you continue. Mm. If you look at the specifications for the Nighthawk AC3200 tri-brand Wi-Fi router. Yes. It says you can get speeds up to 3.2 gigabits per second. It's true. They make this claim, but uh, I, I will let you qualify it because I, I think that their advertising is, I wouldn't say they're, it, it could be considered a bit misleading. Well, it is misleading, right? And what's happening is when they say that you're going to get 3.2 gigabits or 3,200 megabits per second, they are talking about across all the radios, theoretical maximums. So that router is a tri-band router. It has a uh, four by four radio for the 2.4 gigahertz channel. So uh, in each of those on 802.11n, can each of those uh, streams of the radio can go 150 megabits. So 150 times four is 600. Great. So we got 600. Then it has uh, four streams on each of its two five gigahertz radios. 802.11ac goes 433 per stream. 433 times four is, oh, maybe it's only tri stream, three streams. Yeah, it's only three streams on the five gigahertz radios. My, my most, most routers don't do it that way, but this one has a four stream, 2.4 gigahertz radio, and then two three streams. So 433 megabits per second times three streams is 1300. 
plus another 1300. So now we've got 600 plus 1300 is 1900 plus another 1300 is 3200 or 3.2 gigabits. So in order to take advantage of all that speed, we would need a device, a single device, which doesn't exist, uh, with three radios that also match those. And then somehow we'd have to be able to get like the perfect world fa uh, theoretical maximum connection quality out of each of those. TLDR, it ain't going to happen, right? So your iPhone and every Mac that you have except the MacBook Pro and the iMac are all two by two devices, means meaning they have two streams in them. And so if you were to connect to uh, the five gigahertz radio, your iPhone or your MacBook would get a maximum of a connection that goes 866. But 866 is only a theoretical maximum. So we got to ratchet that down. And guess what? What I've seen in, you know, real world tests is right what you've seen, even with a four by four router, it settles in right about five or six hundred megabits for a single Wi-Fi client. Now, as John said, this is a little bit misleading. It is. But if you've got multiple radios on your router, it means that they can reach different devices simultaneously. And you can get more throughput out of these things, especially if you've got, say, uh, one computer copying. Remember in our, our previous uh, segment, we were talking about copying data between two drives. Well, what if you're copying data between two computers and they're both connected via Wi-Fi? Well, if you connect them to two different radios, now they're not sharing and you can start to get some real speeds. So there are benefits to having a tri-band device in addition to just having more bandwidth um, on at different frequency ranges that might be able to avoid some, you know, uh, interference from other things. But the reality is that that 500 megabits a second that you're seeing for your Wi-Fi, uh, you know, your speed test, that's actually really good. It's rare that I see something go over 500. I've seen it, but, um, but usually like on a good day, it's about 450 for me. And, and other times, you know, it's somewhere between two and 300 because I'm not right next to the router or I've got four other routers running because I'm testing things and they get in each other's way and all of that stuff. So yeah, your Wi-Fi router doesn't do gigabit. And it, it really is because your Wi-Fi devices don't do gigabit. Um, and that's, that's what it comes down to. Even your, you know, even your iMac, if it's got a three by three or your MacBook pro with a three by three. So yes, technically max is out at 1300. I've seen that do about 750, maybe 800 on a on a current gen MacBook Pro. And that's pretty darn fast, but it's not gigabit. So there you go. Thoughts on that? No, you're right. Whereas uh, I think in our last episode, we discussed the mechanics of uh, a wired gigabit router, which those in theory can handle oh, yeah. the maximum throughput. Well, on and all his, the does. Ports. his does right by his yeah. tests. Yeah. Well, he said he did Ethernet. The thing is, yeah, why uh, the mechanics of Wi-Fi, and, and I think you, you zeroed in on it, it's that unless you have all the channels that, unless your device that is talking to the Wi-Fi router has all of the radios and all of the channels, you're not going to see this theoretical maximum speed. Right. But you're going to see something pretty good. I mean, the, you know, from what I understand, this is a, you know, it's pretty, pretty snazzy router here. It I mean, is. It looks like. Oh, it's, you it's know. one of the ones I recommend for a standalone router. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's absolutely nothing wrong with it and a lot right about it. So, yeah. yeah. And you know, I mean, how much speed do you need? I mean, come on, you know, kick back and relax and, uh, and you know, just, just kind of. <laughs> well, so no, 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 that's a, that's actually a good sort of extension to this discussion <laughs> because, because that is a good question. Like, I mean, seriously, even, even for Netflix, even for 4k, 25 megabits per second is enough, right? That's what it takes to, to just to stream 4k and 1080p is like six megabits a second. So all of these things that we're talking about, it's like, well, that's crazy. Well, yes, except that the further you get from the radio, the, the less your, the, 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 the less connection strength you're going to have the lower connection strength and therefore lower speeds. So if you're starting out with something that could do on your iPhone, 500 megabits a second on your MacBook Pro, you know, make 750 or something like that. Now, when you get three rooms away, you're still getting 200, maybe 250, 300 megabits per second. 
And that's great, right? So this is why this helps. And this is frankly why mesh uh, in the home can work now because we have 802.11ac that can do these pretty fast uh, speeds over wireless. And that creates the backhaul that this mesh can then use to amplify or, or repeat, I guess is a better way to say it. Yep. And then everything's good. So yeah, no, it's a, it's a, it is a good discussion. It's just, I mean, I know you were doing it to sort of be tongue in cheek and, but it, like there, there's an answer there. So maybe, maybe. No, you're right. I, I, I checked this the other day. So Netflix I have on, on the, uh, well, I have on both the Apple TV and the TiVo, but uh, if you typically if you hit the info button, it'll show you the bandwidth that's being consumed. And yeah, it's on the order of what ten, as you said, for a uh, for HD content, it's like megabits per second. Yeah, single digit, not even maybe. That. Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah, it's, so it's like yeah, so so it, even uh, I would argue even a eight hundred two and access point could probably handle that it could and ac could handle it better right yeah it, the, yes and and just doesn't have the the same bandwidth per stream but it mm -hmm. could it could do it yeah no problem yeah all right uh let's jump to let's jump to joe here and uh joe says to, says to the wizards of wi-fi a question uh my home network has been giving me fits over the last few months with the basic issue being devices lose their Wi-Fi connections. The root of the problem seems to be that my TP-Link Archer C59AC router forgets or ignores its password setting for some devices over the course of a few days. Initially, repowering the router would seem to fix this, but lately that seems to not help. Changing the password, saving, then going back and changing back to the original password now seems to be what works, but is rather a bother. iPhones, iPads, I, uh, home pods or iHome smart plugs are six to eight echoes are ring doorbell and cameras and eco thermostats have all of course been impacted. Interestingly, my four Apple TVs have not wired devices. Of course have no issues, only wireless. I have five to six wired devices and typically 35 wireless today. By chance, I had done a password reset on the router and a couple of the echoes had to be repowered to get them back online. I decided to leave a couple unpowered, and it actually seems like this immediately solved an Ecobee that had been stubbornly offline. I'm now surmising that one or more Internet of Things devices are screwing my network up, either keeping the old IP address or duplicating or somehow else misbehaving. I'm not sure why the router reboot does not fix this, though. This brings me to my question. When you start getting this many wireless devices in the home... How do you start troubleshooting issues like this, separating, separating out a bad router from a bad IOT device? So, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I, I, I guess, you know, in, in terms of how to troubleshoot this, if, if I were to walk, if it were to be my house or a client brought me in and said, OK, you know, here's the problem. Go. The first thing I would do is is take a survey of what are all these devices that we have and are there any you know, that are what I would call off brand. Everything he mentioned was, was on brand, right? But he's, he mentioned some smart plugs. And so maybe one of those is, you know, not something we just hear about all the time. Not that something name brand could have a, couldn't have a problem. Of course it could, but you know, I, you got to start somewhere. So I'd kind of trust my gut on that, find the things and like you found, maybe it's one of your echo devices, right? You said you left it offline and it was, it was, you know, everything else was fine, or at least your Ecobee was fine. So maybe that echo needs to be factory reset and maybe it is holding on to an IP address. Um, you know, so I, I do some of that. And then if that failed, I would put the router, uh, a different router in place just temporarily to isolate your router. I would set up the new router with the same SSID and password. So I didn't have to go around and change any devices and see, does the problem continue? If it does, then we know that it's definitively one of your devices doing something on the network. If it doesn't persist, then it could still be one of your devices and the new router is just handling it differently. And in your scenario better, or it could be that something's flaky with your router. It could also be that your router is having trouble sort of managing that number of devices simultaneously. Um, 35 doesn't seem like a lot, but maybe it's more than 35. I don't know. We've certainly seen it where some routers, I, my cousin 
uh, just had a, it was an old 802.11n router, John. It was like a, you know, 600 speed router kind of thing. And, you know, they've got kids that are playing games and they're actually all, everybody in the family plays games and they've got a lot of devices now and their router, they just had to reboot it once a week because it, it couldn't handle it. So we got them a new router and it's like, it's great. No problems. So it, you know, it, lots of wireless devices require your router to sort of keep not only the devices in, in memory, but also all of the traffic to and from them. It's got to remember, oh yeah, if, you know, if traffic comes in on port, 1040, you know, or not 1042, I'll say, uh, you know, 10,420, uh, that goes to device A and traffic on port 10,421 goes to device B. It's got to keep these these tables, these mapping tables in 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 memory. And maybe you just don't have enough RAM in your router for it. So there you go. And, and it could just be a weird failure, too. Like, you know, who knows? So there you go. I think I'm with you on that. Okay. Looking at this device, uh, and I, I used to use a, a TP-Link, uh, yeah. one of the Archer units, but I don't have nearly as many devices here. So I suspect, as, as I think you do, that you may be reaching the limits of the capabilities of this. I'm looking at the spec sheet for this thing, and it doesn't specify how many devices it can handle at once sure I mean, some people try to do that like apple used to do that for the airport they're like well yeah we can handle 20 or 30 or 40 right right uh, realistically before you know it comes all crashing down but um i'm consider what i'm considering is i wonder if getting a few of the tp link extenders and kind of Doing oh, a quasi mesh thing may help. Maybe it depends on what the issue is. If it's the router not being able to keep all these devices in memory, that won't help. That's right? Be because the that's what I suspect. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm thinking spreading out the pain or, or spreading that, out the bandwidth. Well, but if it's not, that's what I'm saying. If the router, yeah, the router right. still has to be the router, right? There's only right, one right. device doing the routing. So if it can't keep them, it doesn't matter if they're. Uh, although he's saying that he's okay. losing it wireless, not wired. So maybe there's, maybe that is the answer is spread the wireless load around. Yeah, that could be. Yeah. 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 Or. Yeah. Mm. I know. Yeah. So that's it's a tough. toughie. But, that's the but, thing. It's, it's going to take some trial and error and some troubleshooting. And that's, that's where it sounds there. like based on what, what was said here is that it, it, it sounds like you're pushing the limits of what a consumer level wi-fi access point can can handle yeah that's right that's right yeah and check for a firmware update <laughs> that's actually not a bad to, yeah i had to do that with tp link and then then definitely they would have patches where uh one I, I still remember one when i had a tp link and it was like yeah we're you know our dhcp algorithm was kind of messed up and we fixed it so uh that'd be yeah. the first thing to do is see if they have a a firmware update. I, I um, agree. That's there may be right. a bug in their uh, firmware that's uh, you know tossing your devices off the network when when it shouldn't. Yep. It happens. It does. It totally happens. Yeah. All right. While we're on the uh, on the Wi-Fi thing, I want to I want to go to Carl's question. We've had this floating for a little while. So Carl says, uh, my question is, when do you think Apple will support five G cell service in the iPhone? I know five G cell service is still in its infancy. But I think it would be good to have that technology available so that when 5G comes available, we'll be ready for it. What do you think? Is it 2019? Is it 2020? What is it? Um, I think it's not going to be 2019. Um, at this point, I wouldn't even say it's going to be 2020, although Apple's got to already be planning for this. The real trick is when will 5G coverage be ubiquitous enough that it actually makes sense to have it in our phones. And simultaneously, when will we be able to get 5G radios that operate efficiently enough to have them run off of a battery, right? Because the first place that 5G, so 5G is the, the sort of the next iteration of uh, over, over the air broadband, not, not Wi-Fi, but replacing or it, it, moving on past LTE on our, for our, I, I don't want to say our cell phones, but for, you know, from our mobile carriers like AT&T and Verizon and those sorts of things. Uh, they are doing 5G rollouts now uh, this year, and that'll continue into next year. But in the places where they are going to do those, 
what you will get is a 5G router or quote unquote modem that attaches with an antenna to the outside of your house and then comes inside like your cable modem does now and then plugs into a router and then connects to a Wi-Fi access point or, you know, whatever to give you Wi-Fi in your home. Normal Wi-Fi like we have now, um, because that way the 5G radio in your home can be plugged into AC power. Uh, it will replace your cable modem or your DSL or your Fios. And now you don't have to have a wire to your house. You can just do it over the air, which will help in a, a lot of scenarios. And you'll get lots and lots of bandwidth over 5G uh, that way. And again, just like you get with your cable modem, once you get it into your house, then you just connect it to a Wi-Fi router that can talk to everything you already have. So I, I think it'll be a few years before they start adding it to handsets. Apple, um, my guess is it would be 2020 at the earliest, but I I don't, I mean, maybe not even until like 2022. Again, it depends on, on what they can do with, with power and batteries, I think. What do you think, John? I mean, I'm with Verizon and I'm just looking at their statement and there's like, yeah, well, we're going to have very limited rollout in 2018 yeah. and uh, more in 2019. But I think I'm with you is that the, the, you know, it sounds like 2020 to the, the thing is first you got to get Verizon and AT&T and Sprint and all the other guys to deploy it. Duh. And, you know, they got up, you know, they got to install new, new antennas and yeah. their new radios and stuff like that. So, um, or maybe they they just upgrade them remotely. I don't know. Yeah, I, I would assume there's new radios and stuff involved. Oh, definitely. So uh, th there's yeah. going to be a lot of infrastructure upgrade on the part of all all these guys. So um, yeah, what do you think, Pete? Have you th didn't put any thought into the five G thing? I I heard somewhere today, and I don't remember where that uh, Apple was planning on delaying a year at least. Okay. on their next phone based on the 5g and i wish i could source that i can't I, it. it's just something that's in my head but um uh no other than that no i haven't i mean I, obviously we're all looking to the to the day when that comes i mean it's going to be you know compared to a 300 baud modem you know to right. <laughs> to <laughs> yeah to the the, pro the progress and, and you i'm i'm frankly amazed at it watching the is you know as the I, well, speeds have I, increased over the years and they're going to do it again. I'm looking, I'm <laughs> uh, looking so, forward to 5g the, the, actually opening up competition for broadband, like broadband yeah. to the home. I forget about my phone. Yeah. I just like at my house, I want an option other than Comcast. Yeah. Yeah. And you'll be able to tether, tether your phone and Correct. pay that. You know? Correct. Yeah. Sure. yeah the, the reason we have good Comcast speeds here is because even though we can't get Fios in our town, we are part of the Comcast block that includes towns that can get Fios. So they had to open that up to stay competitive. Well, with 5G, now it opens that door and you don't need a cable run to your house. So there's no, like we need to, you know, deal with the, the local municipalities and all of that for running new wires or whatever, or, or leasing space on existing wires. Nope. Here's the, here's the competition. We just turned it on today. So that to me is, is what I'm really looking but, forward to. No, I'm with you because for especially for an iphone like my iphone yeah lte is fine I, I i don't have any personally i don't have any scenarios where i'm like oh my gosh i wish i had more bandwidth the stuff i do on my phone doesn't even probably need lte i i Sometimes I've actually switched down to 3G and, you know, it's fine for, for the stuff that I do. Yeah, but so we're not I'm, talking about what we're doing on our phones no, today. I understand. Right. You yeah. know, I mean, we yeah. like we can right. do video conferencing on our phones because we have the van, the bandwidth to do it. It, yeah. you know, if we rewind 10 years, you we say, well, I don't need bandwidth because the stuff I do on my phone, I don't need it for. But at the same time, we couldn't do video oh, yeah. conferencing. Right. But as so, we discussed. Yeah. yeah. Couldn't do, do Netflix on a modem, on a baud, 300 baud modem. <laughs> or a 9,600 baud yeah, modem, yeah. yeah. But but I think I'm with you is that I think the, the scenario where it's going to make the most impact is it could be a wired broadband replacement. Yeah. I think that's, that's the exactly. power of it. Not, not yeah. so much making your handheld devices being able to do, you know, gigabit or whatever, because do you really need it? But, but, but to provide you a different channel yeah. and kind of break the... Uh, 
you know, kind of monopoly we have in this country right now. <laughs> yeah. Or the, the sub monopolies. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Because yeah. you I mean, have my, one option for a decent My choice speed. for cable yeah. is cable yeah. vision. That's, That's my it. only choice. That's it. In my town, similar to you, or I could get, you know, uh, eight, but each medium, and I think this is pretty much throughout the country, each medium only really has one major player. Correct. Uh, if, if you can even get it. Right. Right. Yeah, exactly. And that's because we've decided we don't want 30 cables strung up on the street. So we only, you know, we essentially offer a monopoly to the various yeah. providers. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's how well, it works. No, that's but, how it works. You know, but, but, but. I mean, if you go back to equal access with telephone lines, the thing is that you share the access to the medium among different providers. You know what I'm saying? I, I do. But like Comcast would have to, per equal access, as I understand it, they have to sell mm -hmm. space to this, on their service to another service provider at a 30% right. discount. That's not like yeah. I, I, I don't know if there's enough there to make. Clearly, there's not enough there for people to make money because no one's doing it, at least not in mass. So we've we've extended these monopolies and in a good I mean, I think it's like I get it It because I don't want 30 cables strung up on the street. I don't want to see a truck every other day putting another one up. You know, sure. that's how it goes. So, no, you know what I'm saying? It's like, well, you know, but if if I give uh, so if you take the major player in town and and if they can rent their infrastructure to other providers, which they have, which to. is technically possible. Yes. Right. Just it's like not profitable. Lines. Right. It's just not profitable. Yeah. Well, if it were, it would be done. I mean, by definition, it's not profitable because otherwise no, someone it. would be right. doing it. Right. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, when there's a will, there's a way. And except if there's not a way to make money. So, yeah. So, uh. 5G can't wait. Same. Yeah. I'm sure we're going to hear I'm sure we're going to hear a lot about it at CES, my I friend. I have no doubt. Yep. <laughs> we heard a lot about 5G at CES last year. So Well, yes. I, yes, yeah. they were they were hyping it definitely and they were Definitely. Like, yeah. This is going to change the world. You're going to be able to do whatever you want, wherever you want, and it's going to be really fast and uh, and all your problems are going to be solved. It's true. Yeah, yeah. And the I server has to be that fast. I, I want 5G <laughs> not between my phone and a server. I want, mm. forget 5G. I want like LTE speeds between my phone and my brain because that's when I get really smart, right? When you I can get, a, when, when you, I can get, get past a this. Implant. Yeah, when I can get past this really slow uh, interface that is either a keyboard or a mouse or, you know, tapping on this thing like that's terribly inefficient i can't get thoughts from my brain into this thing and thoughts from this back into my brain i gotta read it it's really slow so you know yeah. that's that's when when we can increase the speed of that interface we could leave every other speed exactly as it is and we'd all be geniuses Just the moment we can do that chips and planted well, in need. our head and in our that's what Neuralink is up yeah, to right yeah, i mean i don't know yeah. what their what their uh play is but it like that's what Musk is doing with that Neuralink company. So, yeah. Well, don't you, you guys read Neuromancer, right? I mean, I Microsoft. Did. Yeah, that's what it's all about. So you yeah. get a socket in your head, right. and then you plug in modules, and uh, it, it lets you do whatever you want. You want to speak a different language. You want to yeah be a good cook. Uh, hey, just buy the software and plug it in your head. And plug it in. There you go. Yeah, you don't need to plug it into your head. You just plug it into your phone as Man. long as your phone's plugged into your and head. And then you torrent uh, software, and someone's planted a virus in it. And, oh, that's, that could get ugly. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, no, there's like... There's, where's your firewall? <laughs> yeah, where's your firewall? I, you are correct. You are and if correct. you haven't read it, friends, pick it up and give it another read. Neuromancer, William Gibson. Good stuff. Yeah, it's a, it is a good book. Um, it's a whole story about how uh, the whole concept of cyberspace came to be implanted in William Gibson's head. And I think John Perry Barlow and Ketamine were involved in this scenario. But you, I'll leave that as an exercise for the listener. And, uh, and we will tell you how to contact us both before and after you read about that uh, at feedback at MacGeekGab.com. Did um, you say feedback at MacGeekGab.com? No, 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 Pete. He said feedback at MacGeekGab.com. Oh. 
Unless you're a premium subscriber, in which case premium at MacGeekGab.com is the address that you can send things into. And we get to those first, even though even this week we got to everything. Uh, You can call us at 224-888-GEEK. And John, geek is? Four, three, three, five. I thought he was going to say Pete. (laughs) <laughs> you can visit the forums as we said at macgeekgab.com slash forums and our thanks to all of our sponsors of course with uh, with Jamf Now and Smile at textexpander.com uh, slash podcast ring.com slash mgg opsgenie.com such good stuff otherworld computing at maxsales.com barebones software at barebones.com all good stuff. Eero at Eero.com slash MGG. Our thanks to Cashfly at Cashfly.com for providing all the bandwidth to get from us to you. Thanks to you, our listeners. Thanks to you, Pete. I'm glad you're here, man. I'm glad to be here. Glad John, to be anywhere this I'm glad week. you're here. Yes, no kidding. Pete, did you learn anything this week? Perhaps a lesson that you want to encapsulate and share with everyone. Man, we got away with it. We got. I'm here in one piece, and I almost wasn't. And it's only because I didn't. And don't you get caught? Made up. <laughs>